everybody and a very warm welcome to this evening uh, this evening's event for Five Leaves Bookshop. My name is Jane Anger. I'm one of the booksellers at Five Leaves and my colleague Simon Griffiths is doing the tech for us tonight. Um, it's a very warm welcome to Leslie Kern who's joining us from Canada today tonight for us. Um, she's Associate Professor of Geography and the Environment and Director of Women's and Gender Studies at Mount Allison University in Canada. And we're here to talk about her book, Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. It's a really good book. And a warm welcome to, to Jane Todd, who's formerly Chief, Chief Executive of Nottingham City Council. Jane will be hosting this evening, um, but before I hand over to her, uh, there's just a few things about the format and um, the, the, the Q&A and things. Um, first of all, there's at least 60 of you have enrolled for this, so welcome. Do put in the chat where you're viewing from, because that's really interesting for us. Put it for panellists and attendees, and then everybody gets a sense of who's in the room. Um, Simon will put up links to buying the book from us every now and again in the chat, but it's very easy to find also on our web shop. Um, Jane Todd is going to have a conversation with Leslie. And then about 15 minutes before the end, I'll pop up again and I'll field, field the Q&As from yourself. So do think of your Q&As, put them in the Q&A box. I won't be monitoring that for questions. Um, the chat is just for saying where you're from. Please put your questions in the Q&A and then we'll pick them up from there and we'll have a um, question and answer session at the end. So finally, welcome and over to you, Jane. Right, welcome to everybody and hi. First, Leslie, let me say I enjoyed the book immensely and found it, I found it engaging, it was interesting, thought provoking. So it's great for me to really have this opportunity to discuss it. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the book and how you came to write it? Yes, uh, I'd be happy to. Well, as the introduction suggested in my day job, I'm a university professor in a geography department and also work with women's and gender studies. My, my uh, academic background is actually in women's and gender studies. And I sort of came to the, the topic of gender and cities through my PhD research, where I was looking at um, what at the time in the early 2000s in Toronto was a huge condominium building boom. And there was all of these news stories about uh, young women buying condos and how this was some kind of feminist revolution, some kind of sex in the city moment. And I was like, well, okay, interesting. Let me uh, learn a little bit more about that. So through that research, I was kind of introduced to a world of feminist perspectives on cities, on space, and how power relations across gender and, and other axes of identity and so on operate through the environments around us, both the built environments, uh, the natural environment, and, and so on. And to me, this was just such a fascinating way to understand how power operates. So mm -hmm. the idea to write the book was really to take these ideas that I you know, write about as an academic and that I talk about in my classrooms to a wider audience of people so that as we kind of move through our cities, we can look around and uh, instead of taking for granted the, the buildings that are there, the way the streets are laid out, how the buses run or, or don't run and so on, we can ask questions like, oh, why is it set up this way? Who benefits from this organization of urban space? Um, who has power in this um, space? And what kind of messages are, are communicated to us about inclusion and exclusion? So that was sort of the impetus behind the book. And I've been really lucky over the last year and a half to have great conversations with, with folks like yourselves and communities all over the world who are really interested, not just in, you know, what's a feminist perspective on cities, but how do we make our cities more inclusive? How do we reach for justice? How do we think about equity? How do we address various crises that we're facing? Right, yeah. It I can see how it's sort of come together. You organized it very much into a number of themes, each with their own chapter. I found that very easy in, you know, like the city of men, of mums, of friends, city of one, etc. And I, I found that an easy way of looking at it. And I felt the central thesis about the experience of cities being very different depending on gender, race, ability. And I think that came over very strongly. And 
how did you decide on the themes? I was very interested in them, but how did you decide on those particular ones? Did you have hundreds and then whittle it down or did you, did they, were they the standout themes? Well, for me, the, the themes were things that for me had been kind of central to the development of my own thinking about the relationship between gender, power, and cities that had been central to, I guess, the development of my own relationship to the various cities that I, I grew up in and, and lived in for many years. So it was um, not so much a, a kind of like an academic organizing of the book, but almost um, an experiential organizing of the book into those areas that really, I thought, kind of encapsulated what for me were not not exactly key moments, but key like ways of relating to the city. For so, city of moms, for example, um, I, I lived in London, England at the time when I had my uh, daughter, my first and, and only uh, child, and that was really an experiential moment for me when I suddenly realized that the city was in many ways not built for me as a young mom and, mm -hmm. and that the, the city that I had loved for so long and that I felt so free and, and um, you know, passionate about and, and had so much fun in was suddenly throwing up all of these barriers in, in my face and making it very hard just to go about my day-to-day -day life with a, with a baby in a stroller. So even before I knew anything about feminist geography, um, I would sort of having those those moments that were making me question oh like who is the city for do i belong here anymore and you know that's how how that chapter kind of came to be almost right at the front of the book and the others are you know sort of similarly organized uh, to reflect those experiences and and did did um, any of them resonate for you more than others of those themes the chapters well i think one of the themes that in some ways, because of um, events over the last couple of years, the, the chapter, um, I think it's called City of Protest. It's about activism in cities. And I think, especially over the last year and a half, but, but even extending further, the you know, resurgence of movements like Black Lives Matter and so on have kind of reminded, I think, all of us of the importance of using urban space for political action for actually taking to the streets when it's necessary for, you know, showing up for kind of speaking truth to, to power. So uh, I don't know, you know, when I wrote the book that I, I would have said, oh yeah, this is going to, to be a, a sort of really resonant chapter. But I think just given the way that certain events unfolded, it turned out to, on retrospect, I'm really glad that I included it because I think um, it, it was, it's important to articulate that, you know, through protest is also a way that we come to belong in, in the city, that we come to claim it as our own or to claim some space, some rights, some, some recognition mm. in our cities. Yeah, I think that I, that, that I thought came over very powerfully. And when you do each of your themes, your chapters, you it include a personal account, a kind of narrative of where you are with it, which I loved because for me, it was fundamental to why we found it, I found it so engaging. Because as your story for each of those areas, it drew me into each of those themes, even when it wasn't particularly my experience. And I think that was very valuable. So I could sort of recognize bits that were, yes, very powerful for me, like protests, I understand that one, and the city of fear as well. I found that fascinating, the, you know, the social control angle of that, that we're taught to be frightened of stranger danger and places and where things are. And yet the reality of the data shows us that really it's domestic violence, it's the home that's the scary place. And I think that's a very interesting way of looking at it, particularly at the moment with COVID, when we're all forced back into our homes mm -hmm. and we know domestic violence has increased. So was that a very intentional thing, the way you did it in that way? Was that ab about drawing us in or was it also about getting your narrative over so it wasn't just academic? 
Sure, a little bit of both. And I think also just drawing on a really long tradition of you know, feminist writing that kind of, you know, starts from the personal, right? The personal is political, <laughs> you know, yes, there's absolutely. a reason why that, that phrase has resonated for so many decades. Uh, but, but it is part of, I think, a, a feminist academic, but, but just in general, a knowledge producing process to kind of start from where you are, which is important for a number of reasons. One, it, it, it is a way of forming connections with others. I think one of the power of, of you know, all sorts of feminist causes is to show other, other women that you're not alone, this thing that you're experiencing, you know, you're not um, imagining it, or it's not just you, it's not an individual problem, it's systemic. So that's a key part of it. It's also about recognizing that, you know, my experience, as much as I, I you know, share it and hope that people connect to something in it is not universal. I embody um, a fair number of privileges in society that probably create certain, you know, blind spots to other people's experiences as well. So being clear about kind of who I am and where I'm coming from is uh, Im important for, you know, not trying to put myself out there as, you know, the universal woman that every other woman's experience is like this, but to say, you know, this is me, I'm from this place. And these are the things that I've noticed and experienced, um, and then to kind of invite others to to share both what they um, did find familiar and, and maybe what they didn't or what they would like to add on um, based on their, their own experiences. Yeah, I think one of the areas that I found I'd never thought about was the personal space theme. Mm -hmm. And the use of technology as something as a, almost a protective element as you're around and it may be because as an older woman you know I'm if I'm out and about it it's got to the point where I'm pretty pretty safe with things but that whole personal space one and the, the how do you make the city something for personal space I found absolutely fascinating Could you say a bit more about that one yeah I mean I think um, whatever gender you are, there is a, a tension in a city life in that you are surrounded by often millions of people, the vast majority of whom are strangers. And part of the, you know, the, the, the joy of city life is, you know, having moments of yeah. interaction and being amongst other people. Yet at the same time, I don't think anybody can kind of uh, be expected to like withstand uh, the sort of the onslaught <laughs> of potential interactions with with so many people, but particularly for women who do experience so much, um, you know, both both outright harassment and catcalling, which are, are often quite like frightening and unpleasant experiences, but even just the mundane, like, oh, you know, hey, love, cheer up, give us a smile. Uh, what are you reading? Talk to me while I'm, you know, standing here on the tube board kind of stuff that is just like, so many things we could say about it. What, what one is just that you know I think for many women we we don't actually know whether that is a benign interaction or whether that is potentially leading to threats or harassment or someone following you right. So we're always very wary and and sometimes we need a little buffer zone. So, um, you know, reading a book is is kind of a buffer zone. And in fact, in the Canadian edition of Feminist City, which was published a little bit before the US and UK editions, it's a paperback and the back flap opens up, like as if you were if you were standing and reading it, you kind of open up the back flap and it says, fuck off, I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, but you were mentioning technology and in, in the book I mentioned, you know, how the use of um, earbuds or, or, or headphones, right, to signal I'm listening to music or podcast or whatever, you know, don't speak to me is, is a way for women to kind of try to create a little boundary of personal space. It's not impermeable. Uh, people will still probably try to talk to you, but it gives you like a little bit of a chance of kind of creating your, your own bubble, because I think uh, many women kind of don't have the privilege of just like gliding through the city, being unmolested or unharassed on a day-to-day -day basis. So even though it can seem a little bit antisocial maybe to, you know, for everybody to just have their headphones in, I think for some people it is kind of a survival strategy just to like get through your day without being 
scared or anxious or just really annoyed. Yeah, and even just yesterday I was talking to someone and, and she said she'd felt nervous somewhere and had taken her phone out. Mm -hmm. So it looked as though she was talking to someone so that it meant that if somebody came up to this person came up to her, she would be able to feel as though she was talking to someone else and get a message over. So mm -hmm. I think it's really very accurate that um, I, it's just I'd never thought about it before. So I thought it was very interesting. I think you've mentioned this just a, a minute ago as well. The, I would say one of the dangers of using your own story is obviously it, it, it inevitably shapes the narrative in a particular way, depending on your experiences and everything, as, you, as you've already mentioned. And I feel that you're at pains to discuss and also to reference women from many different backgrounds and lives. Can you tell us a bit more about how you did this? Because that, that was where really some of the research came in, I felt. And you gave us lots of examples of different lives, black lives, you know, disability, etc. Was that one of the ones that needed a lot of research? Yes, absolutely. I mean, a key part for me of uh, any kind of feminist project writing or otherwise is to try to take an intersectional approach by which we mean we understand that systems like gender oppression interact and interlock with other systems of oppression like racism, colonialism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, ageism, ableism, and so on. Um, and, and it, it, you know, it, it, builds up a fairly complex picture. I don't think anybody can ever kind of entirely do justice to a, you know, 100% intersectional approach, but part of trying to, as you say, kind of, I don't wanna say overcome, but acknowledge and work with the limitations of one's own singular perspective is to bring in the voices of, of other uh, scholars, activists, you know, journalists, mm. writers, um, and so on that I that I tried to pull into the book and to try to pull in a variety of places. Again, I, I won't claim that it's some kind of, you know, perfect global representation of, of different um, cities and different women's lives in those cities, but tried to have a little bit of balance so that it's not just all about, um, you know, certain big, well-known global north cities. And, and through doing that, even, you know, with all of the limitations and with all of the things that I probably still missed, hopefully it reminds the reader to always be thinking about like, okay, certain things kind of appear this way to me, or I experience the world in, in this way, but, oh yeah, if I was coming at this from a different set of life circumstances, then, you know, this, this daily experience that I've had, or this uh, perspective that I have on how the world is organized might be very different. So it, it's about kind of, yeah, opening up that that space to at least think about those things, even if we don't know the answers to, oh, yeah, what is it like to be, you know, a, a disabled single mother? You know, I, I don't know what that's like, but I can start to imagine or I can say, I'm going to read mm. up on that and, and maybe try to learn more. And were there any particular either academics or uh, studies or, or or people that were more influential that really shaped the way you were thinking? Hmm. Hmm. That is a good question. I I would say that to just give a general sort of answer as I you know, let the wheels turn and try to yeah. remember. <laughs> I've been working on another book. So oh. now I'm like, what did I write about in Feminicity? Um, that, you know, part of the, the book is sort of try, tries to be grounded in, you know, several decades now of feminist scholarship about cities. So mm -hmm. both um, people who are geographers, planners, sociologists, um, women's studies scholars, and so on. So to try to bring in that sort of you know, research, the, the empirical work, the theoretical work that, that has been done for, for so long, but also to bring in voices of more popular writers. So I talk about um, Roxane Gay at one point and some of the 
material that she has in her book from I think 2014 now, Bad Feminist, where, where she talks about friendship, for example, in that book. Um, I try to bring in some, you know, pop culture, talk a little bit about shows like Sex and the City and, and uh, Broad City, um, Insecure, uh, popular programs like that, that kind of represent <clears throat> different sorts of women's lives in the city. So yeah, looking back, it's hard for me to say whether there was sort of a, a couple of key people who were I influential, but it was more about um, trying to pull from a variety of different what's the word I'm looking for, types of people, not, not so much in terms of, mm -hmm. not just in terms of their, their identities, but not just academics, for example, right? But to recognize that people from all sorts of different professions and backgrounds uh, bring a, a lot of knowledge with them to topics like, like the city. Yeah, and, and did you feel, I mean, obviously I think it comes over that you tried very hard to, to get that inclusivity. How, how successful did you find it do you think it was in, in coming together? Mm. Well, I think I would say that as, as I've had the opportunity to, to talk with, with people uh, kind of a, around the world uh, about the book that, you know, people have certainly pointed out to me some geographical gaps. So for example, I was right. to a journalist um, in Japan and, and she was like, you know, uh, if you want to actually know more about women in Asian cities, uh, we, we could connect you with some people about that. So it was kind of a, you know, reminding me like, oh yeah, there, there's not really a great deal of, of content about that. There's certainly, you know, very fair to say there's, I was gonna say North American, but let's be honest, it's a Canada, US, <laughs> North American bias and kind of UK, Europe bias in terms of, um, the, the, the majority of the material that I draw on. And part of that is, you know, it's my own academic background. I'm not as much of an expert in, um, in cities and, and gender issues in other parts of the world. And so I would say I was um, <laughs> successful at gesturing to the global implications, but probably not successful in fully like and richly working through, you know, some key differences perhaps in women's experiences between say global South and global North cities mm -hmm. and the, the kind of Anglo dominant world and um, the non Anglo dominant world, if you will. So lots more to write about then there. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots of sequels. Um, the, I think one of the chapters that I found very interesting as well was around the friendship and the way women's friendship is so important in cities. Do you want to say a little bit more about that so people get a feel for it? Because it, 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 it was something, I'd, another a bit like the personal space one that I hadn't really thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from my personal perspective, the experience of being a young woman who went to you know I went to the University of Toronto so I lived in you know downtown when I was you know 18 right going going off to school and the friendships that I built in that place were so kind of tied up with our experiences as young women moving into adulthood stepping into a kind of independence away from our you know family homes for the first time and for the first time really having um, almost, you know, full freedom to explore a city that, you know, many of us had lived near <laughs> growing up and had some experience of, but of course, you know, when you're a, a kid and a teenager, you're still under a lot of parental control, family control. So suddenly, you know, being like, oh, I can stay out till 3 a.m. Oh, I can go to this part of town. I, I can go to this bar. I can, you know, go to this party, have these experiences was, um, really important, but it was it was always with other women, <laughs> with friends. It was not something that you did on your own, and not just because of safety concerns. But it was, you know, what, why would you want to do that, right? When you had these these great friendships budding, and from that experience, I started to want to think more about, okay, but what are the broader implications of this if we start to imagine 
the importance of women's friendships, which are so often kind of culturally undermined, or we have very negative narratives about what women's friendships are like. So I wanted to think, you know, um, in a sort of different way about how women kind of take care of one another in the city. You know, we're given so many narratives about why you should be afraid and, you know, how you should never go out alone and so on. And, and you know, maybe instead of interpreting the uh, desire to kind of travel in packs as like a, an oppressive mechanism or some kind of weird gendered quirk, we could see it as a way that women collectively organize to look after one another in situations that are not really made for our, our comfort. And beyond that, I wanted to, you know, kind of take that even a step further and think about what if we kind of organized our cities, not solely around the idea of the traditional heterosexual nuclear family, but we imagined other sorts of households, relationships, mm -hmm. kinship formations as equally important. You know, what would our homes look like? What would our neighborhoods look like if we could build or, or simply even imagine communities where it was normal for friends to live together, not just while you're young and in your 20s, but throughout your life, right? Or for different households to uh, share space together or simply for, you know, not everyone to be looking for a romantic partnership with one other person to be the, you know, most important relationship in their, in their lives. And I think there's some radical potential in that, especially given the way that, you know, the, the traditional home and, and traditional family really relies on women's unpaid labor to kind of keep it going. So if we start to think about, ah, what if we, um, you know, didn't kind of funnel women <laughs> into marriage and, and motherhood on a certain track, oh, who would do that care labor? <laughs> like, how would we organize that? And I think that has kind of interesting, you know, destabilizing kind of um, potential for uh, not just cities, but kind of how we organize households, families, and all of that domestic labor that keeps the world turning. Yeah, I think that's very interesting, because I mean, certainly being much younger in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that was indeed some of the things that we were pulling together you know, living in communes, sharing much more in terms of children, bringing up of children, then looking at households, etc. And it seems to me that a lot of that flexibility has gone and it's become more rigid, you know, that we live in very poor, small nuclear situations mm -hmm. from one to one. And I think it's to the detriment of children. Yeah, I families. agree. Yeah, and I, I think my my PhD supervisor uh, is an urban sociologist named Gerda Weckerly, and in the 70s and 80s, she did a lot of research in the Canadian and U.S. context about different kind of housing formations, like cooperative housing mm -hmm. and communes and so on. And she, you know, pointed out that yeah, a lot of that started to fall away through through the 80s and into the 90s as governments like. Thatcher in the UK, <laughs> Reagan in the US, Mulroney in Canada, essentially early neoliberal um, governments that were kind of all about privatization. So a lot of what had been publicly funded in terms of both public housing, but also innovative and different forms of housing that you could perhaps, you know, get some money to build and to maintain. A lot of that was really dried up as that sort of neoliberal, you know, push to privatization in the housing sector and in so many other uh, social sectors as well uh, went forward. So a lot of that innovation and a lot of the opportunity to do things differently, I think really dried up around that time. And, and now we kind of have this chicken and egg situation where it's like, oh, well, maybe people don't want this because nobody lives like this, but people haven't really <laughs> had the chance to live like this. So, you know, is it sort of, if we build it, they will come? Like, can we take that risk to build something different? I think a lot of people around the world are are kind of branching out on their own, whether it's like two or three families working together to buy a home or to buy, you know, adjacent homes so mm -hmm. that they can kind of do that shared work, whether it's co-housing for seniors, um, you know, those, those, you know, other sorts of options. You know, it's important to recognize that like the single family home as we know it, it's not a very 
well, it's relatively new in human history and it's not a universal form of a way of living. So just because it's come to seem normal to so many of us in, in sort of Western global North cities doesn't mean it has to be that way. No, and I think certainly that's happened very much in the UK. And although there are quite a lot of uh, sharing between generations now, that's always portrayed, as far as I can see, as a negative. A negative, and it's there because the younger generation can't afford to move away. They can't afford to be separate, and then they're forced back on to the detriment of both the older generation and the younger generation, it's not seen, I don't think, as often the positive that my experience of families like this are, and certainly from different cultural backgrounds as well, that it, it could be much more positively portrayed as well, couldn't it? Oh, absolutely. It, it's very similar here as well. I think there is in, in countries where there's a strong emphasis on home ownership mm -hmm. as a like, there's this idea that if you don't maintain that, then you kind of are not a full adult in some way that you have not um, achieved a certain kind of like social and class status, but also that you are somehow like emotionally stunted or, or whatever. We have this strong association that mm -hmm. I think we really have to work to break apart between property ownership and um, and, you know, adulthood or, or status. So again, recognizing that that's not a, a universal way of thinking about the home is a, an important first step, but I totally agree with you. You know, we need, uh, some different stories, right. About what, what it really is like to live in multi-generational homes or in co-housing or to have roommates, um, you know, by choice <laughs> throughout your life, like, those stories are out there, but you're right, they're not the, the ones that we mostly hear about. Living with friends, rather than they don't have to be in that sexual relationship for whatever reason. Exactly. Um, thinking about moving on, looking at the future, is there another theme waiting to be written about the impact of COVID and how that's impacted on cities? Because I'm really aware that it's kind of, put COVID and the way we've been forced into our own space, um, plus the move that was already starting for cities no longer to be centres of the retail mm. sector because they haven't, you know, of online shopping, etc. Then, you know, I think there's a big, some big questions about what is going to happen in the future. But, you know, that whole area of cleanliness, germs, you know, the impact on the psyche of that kind of world and, the, and what's going to happen. Have you, have you been thinking about that at all? Yes, definitely. Uh, and I certainly agree that COVID has suggested that there could be and maybe needs to be some major transformations in areas like home, work, and public space. Um, I think Simon may have some links to a couple of like short essays that I've written about that, that he might be able to share Great. in the chat. But um, yes, so thinking about the home, for example, as you mentioned um, uh, earlier on in our conversation, when we were, you were, we were talking about domestic violence, I think the sort of the assumption that like everybody has a home, that the home is a safe space for everybody. Um, that that um, there is somebody available in the home to do care work, especially for children when schools and daycares were were shut down and you know kind of roll on a rolling basis. These are all you know based on really problematic assumptions that that feminists have been trying to challenge for a really long time, and yet it seemed to come as a complete surprise to like governments and public health authorities that oh actually um, women are also essential workers. <laughs> um, you know there there isn't always you know a caregiver in the home that our cities are not set up terribly well to facilitate care work when it's you know, not being done in the private space of the home. So I think there's a real kind of shock wave um, through many parts of society going, oh yeah, maybe we really need to rethink like what the home is for, who lives there and, and so on. Um, 
public space as well, you know, thinking about during, during lockdowns or um, partial lockdowns, if you will, we were encouraged to go out and use urban public space more, right? To do our socializing outdoors, mm -hmm. to, you know, avoid indoor spaces for, for safety and so on. Um, but many of us found that as we tried to make use of our urban public spaces, there's nowhere to sit. There's no toilets. There's nowhere to get um, water or, or snacks. It isn't a private business. There's no shelter um, and shade. There is a kind of like almost a hostile built environment that is designed, you know, in big cities like London to kind of protect us from crime or the threat of terrorist attacks. But what it's done is to, you know, hollow out the kind of human part of, of living in cities and make it very hard just to find a place to like gather with friends or, or other family members or whatever and to enjoy outdoor activities. So it's definitely, I think, a moment where cities could kind of rethink some of their strategies of making uh, public space this kind of like militarized, surveilled, over-policed, you know, really un physically unpleasant environment to be in and to say, oh yeah, if it is safer for people to be outside in an era of pandemics and whatnot, then we, we're going to need to provide basic services like just somewhere to go to the toilet, right? Like Absolutely. And that is such yeah. an important thing. You actually make something of toilets. And we found certainly when in Nottingham, it was one of the most important things to ensure and particularly as department stores perhaps closed down, mouths closed down, they're no longer the kind of world it was, that what gets left often is that kind of <laughs> basic thing like toilets and how important that is. Mm -hmm. Do you think any, many of the, are there any particular countries or cities that have fared better in this kind of world with COVID than others that are, are, are examples to us that we could have a look at and say, actually, this worked reasonably well? Mm. Well, you know, I, I think just from my own kind of, you know, following of the news and, and so on, many cities took an opportunity to uh, shut down streets to car traffic and open up greater space for both oh. parking and pedestrian space, right? Because, you know, with people not needing to travel into the city uh, for work, if people are working from home or whatever, um, there's kind of, you know, the idea that, oh yeah, we, we could actually close down some streets. So I know like in Canada, you know, Toronto and Montreal both experimented with this. And the question is kind of like, could we continue this? Could we continue to, you know, not prioritize the car over everything and everyone else. I think that's also part of, you know, the the, the problem with with urban public space for many people, uh, that, or that many people have noticed in recent decades is that we, you know, everything is about car movement efficiency, you know, and cars just take up so much space, both the roadways, the parking, the service centers, like so much of urban space is dedicated to cars and relatively little to pedestrians, biking, play, sitting, rest, those kinds of things. So to, to have major cities kind of close down streets to cars and say, okay, you know, we're going to put some more benches, we're going to make wider cycling lanes, which is so much, you know, safer for people <laughs> to not be cycling through, through car traffic. Those have been, you know, very relatively simple changes, you know, they don't require bulldozing anything or building something, it's just changing traffic flow. Um, can we keep that going forward? I would say that we we really should, but um, you know, we'll we'll it will <laughs> it remains to be seen whether that will be the case. And, that, and one of the things I can see, you mentioned quite a bit about gentrification, which I'm really aware of. I mean, apart from anything else, it's pretty bland the effect it has on uh, areas. But also, I think. What we can see, and especially in a small country like the UK, is that gentrification of rural areas is going to be one of the biggest moves. In fact, you can still see it all well already as people are scared to be 
in the urban areas as they're having to put up with spaces that haven't got the freedom, haven't got the green, haven't got the idea of air flowing through all of that. And what we're seeing already is people moving out. And I think that's going to have a tremendous effect on rural areas. I mean, you'll know about that because you've lived in both. Yes, totally. And, and I think also part of that push is that cities are ridiculously expensive, right? So, you know, gentrification is then pushing people out, which can spark gentrification somewhere else. But yes, I mean, where I live right now, I live in a town called Sackville, New Brunswick. It's a town of 5,000 people in a very rural province. Um, we kind of, the joke in Canada is that New Brunswick is like the drive-through province. People drive through it to get to Nova Scotia, which is like more well-known for its, I don't know, beauty and charm, I guess. It's not a place that people typically migrate to from other parts of Canada. But since the pandemic started, there's been a like a real estate mm -hmm. boom in New Brunswick of people sight unseen, you know, coming from from Toronto or other parts of Ontario, um, wanting more affordable housing, wanting all of the things that you described, you know, fresh air, <laughs> uh, distance from your neighbors, all those kinds of things, and and buying up property here. We're we're the the cities in this province are seeing, you know. Uh, steep hikes in rent for people and there's like no rent control because it hasn't been seen as a problem here before. Uh, so I think you're right that smaller towns and cities are going to be grappling with problems that they didn't know they would have or had never, you know, predicted to kind of touch down. Um, and, and it will be a question, you know, what can they do to maintain affordable housing stock, to maintain the character of the community, to make sure that, you know, uh, older people, especially who are quite vulnerable to displacement, if they're on, you know, fixed income and so on, that they can remain in their homes. Um, you know, these are important issues to consider. And, and if you had, the, if I handed over to you the authority and the funding to change things, what would be your top three be to improve life? You no, know, for women, because this is what we're talking about in those urban areas. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, housing. So uh, making sure there's uh, affordable housing. I think that the lack of affordable housing is a contributor to violence against women because women uh, can't afford to leave abusive situations um, mm -hmm. within partnerships and in many places are kind of forced essentially to remain living in, in abusive situations because there is like so little <laughs> available that is affordable to women, especially women who may be uh, single mothers. And, you know, housing is so important. It's kind of like without that base of a, a secure and safe place to call home, you know, it's very hard to do anything else in your life, right? It's very hard to have a career, to, you know, get your kids into decent schools, to, you know, be, be fulfilled, all of those sorts of things. So housing, you know, would be really important. Transportation is another key area, mm. you know, the way that cities have been set up with our, you know, again, car heavy, which benefits men more than women because men have more access to private vehicles than women do. Women use public transportation and, and walking more than men. So can we kind of rethink transportation equity, uh, rethink the way that transport routes work to help facilitate uh, not just the journey from home to work, but all of those kind of caregiving journeys that happen in between and so on. So, you know, transportation equity would be maybe number two. Um, number three, gosh, so many things we could think about. I mean, I guess, you know, it would be kind of silly of me not to mention safety and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we could we could have a whole other, you know, hour conversation about this, but I think cities can um, think about both looking beyond sort of the, well, we put up some more light, so what else can we do to <clears throat> think about safety to, <laughs> uh, you know, other physical design changes, but also kind of how, how can cities play a role in a cultural shift that makes violence and harassment against women and, and other marginalized people completely unacceptable? And how can cities, imagine playing a role in ending domestic violence, right? These are not really, or they shouldn't in my view be completely separate 
policy spheres, but often they are very divided. You know, urban policy doesn't deal with things like domestic violence service provision, but I think cities have a role to play there too. So, you know, revolutionizing how we think about safety, I guess would be number three on my list. And, and just before we pass over to the Q&A, your plans for the future? You mentioned new books. <laughs> yes, well, I'm uh, writing a book about gentrification. It's actually oh, great. the first few full draft is done and uh, <laughs> my trusty editors at, at Verso are, are looking it over at the moment. So this is a book that is again, meant for a, a wide audience of people um, to, <clears throat> take a, a kind of an intersectional, not kind of, an intersectional approach to gentrification, thinking about it not solely as a class-based problem or process, but also thinking about how factors like gender, race, and colonialism are, are implicated in gentrification and to challenge the idea that gentrification is inevitable and that there's nothing we can do to um, stop it or to push back against it. So that is due to come out um, in 2022 from Verso. Oh, well, I shall certainly look forward to that. Well, I think we'll pass over now to Jane to organize the um, Q&A. Many, many thanks from me. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I would recommend anybody to have a look at the book as well. Thank you so, so much for your great questions, Jane. <laughs> thank you. Do I have to do anything to pass over to Jane or not? No. He's coming. I'm there. Yeah, good. Okay. Hi everybody. Thank you for that. That was that was really interesting and raised a lot of the issues in the book. We've got some questions coming from the audience, which is great. Um, so first, Sally Morowitz has said, I also found your book very thought pro provoking and for once really accessible. I'm interested in how the sometimes contradictory needs of different communities can be further addressed, i.e. sex workers, black communities and the police and calls for safe streets. Mm. Yes. Um. <laughs> yeah. Such a simple seeming question, right? But that is like, oh, okay, this is the real, <laughs> you know, a, 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 big, a, a big set of questions. And I think I, I've been, Fortunate, you know, especially during the, the course of the, the pandemic and again, resurgence of Black Lives Matter and a kind of a police abolitionist movement to be thinking and rethinking some of my own um, ideas about this. But, you know, yeah, there is this sort of tension between how do we create like safety for women in public spaces without the traditional forms of policing and surveillance and, and so on that we have so long relied on. And often the way that the public debate is framed kind of pits those as competing objectives, right? That you, um, if we take away the police, then women won't be safe. Um, so don't we care about the women kind of thing? I think what I've kind of, you know, come to, to learn and understand and to, to want to share is that, you know, ultimately the things that will make women safer over the long run. And I acknowledge that we will not transform this overnight, but the things that I mentioned like housing, right? Like guaranteed affordable housing for everyone, that would do more to end violence against women. The majority of which is in the home from people that they know, <laughs> right? Than any police on the streets have ever done and could ever do. And I think we also have to recognize, you know, who are we talking about when we talk about like, uh, women's safety, you know, if we're talking about um, women of color in low income housing council housing estates, probably over policing of those communities uh, does them more harm as as well than than it does benefit. So we also can't, you know, throw some women under the bus like sex workers, trans women, low income women and women of color in order to procure safety for women who are already relatively privileged. So I would, yeah, encourage us to think about like, what kind of real ground up solutions would improve women's safety, you know, childcare, <laughs> education, housing, these are the things that would really truly make a difference. Thank you very much. Um, now we've got a question from Rosemary Jarrett. 
I studied human geography and cities in particular in the late 90s. There wasn't a lot of feminist geographers around then. I do remember Jane Jacobs. I loved her descriptions of city life, i.e. dancing people. Do you think that it's important to approach city planning from a perspective of this? Is the woman's way of doing things and how easy is it to influence planners and architects in this way now? Mm. Yeah, you're totally right that um, even today, as I've had the privilege of, of chatting with, with architecture organizations like professional associations and schools and so on that uh, people will still, you know, tell me, oh, I, I, I wish I'd learned about this in school or yeah, I don't really know any other famous female urbanists besides <laughs> Jane Jacobs. So I think that gap is still there. Um, sometimes it's frustrating because none of the ideas that I put forward in the book come only for me, they've been around for many decades. There's no reason why it should be taking so long for these things to filter through. But, you know, any opportunity to start or restart the conversation is a good one. Um, I would say that people have been interested in engaging with some of the principles and ideas that I put forward um, in the book. There is an acknowledgement that, that, you know, issues of equity, access, inclusion, and so on are very pressing issues in, in cities uh, and that we need to think about ways to do things differently. So I would say there's interest, but like anything else that is kind of systemic, right, institutionalized, it, it takes a long time to change. So we need, you know, better uh, representation of diverse groups of people within those professions. Um, we need, you know, more people kind of from the ground up pushing for change. We need more community consultation. These things are kind of slow to happen, but, you know, they, they are happening slowly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, in fact, I know in the book you give a lot of references um, to other geographers who've done a lot of work, as well as being inspired by a lot of the activists like Adrian Rich. Yeah. And anybody who quotes Adrian Rich in a book, in my book, is, is, is spot on. But there are lots of other geographers quoted in the book, if, if Rosemary's interested in looking at that. Um, and on the topic of reading, Sophie's asked, what further reading would Leslie recommend to learn more about global cities and how they're set up? Mm. Hmm. A reading list. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know. And I, <laughs> starting in September, I'm teaching my course on global cities. So I should certainly be able to answer this question. I mean, interestingly, I'll, I'll say that a lot of the writing on global cities, the well-known writing is by um, white men and to a lesser extent, white women in very privileged global North cities. There's a kind of over-focus on like, London, Tokyo, New York as the pinnacle of, of global city, global cityness. And uh, in the course that I teach about it, I try to sort of subvert that and not read any of those people. And we try to only read work from like women and queer theorists and people of color and, and global south uh, theory. So I guess I would just sort of point that out that if you do kind of dip your toes into the world of global city literature that that the first things that will come up will be from you know kind of the usual suspects if you will um you know the south african scholar jennifer robinson writes about ordinary cities from a kind of you know as, as a way of challenging what we know or, or think about as global cities um the feminist geographer Linda Peak also has a kind of global feminist urban research project that tries to think about links between global north and global south um, and to not privilege kind of global north perspectives in that way. So those are a couple that I would mention off the top of my head. Great, thanks. And Sophie also, I understand that the publisher Zed publishes a lot of stuff on global global right. cities as well um, in this country. So uh, it might be worth looking at their list. Um, Karen Stainer has asked, can ideas in the book usefully be incorporated into the redesign of Nottingham Broadmarsh Centre area? And um, perhaps Jane, you can explain a bit about that in case people don't know. Yeah, the Broadmarsh is one of those big areas. There were always two big shopping areas, shopping 
centres in Nottingham City. And this has shrunk now into one area. And there's always the broad marsh that needs uh, a new way of looking at it. And yes, I think a lot of the ideas could go into broad marsh. It's been very much for traders, how can we make it greener? How can we make it environmentally and sustainably sound? But I think there are those. But the big issue in Broadmarsh is that it's all very well going out and asking people, but the, it's also the issue about funding and where will the funding come from? And in my view, I think this is going to be one of the problems that people will be involved in ideas. They'll come up with ideas, particularly on the women's side, but where will the money come to do it? And that is all part of what Karen, uh, we were talking about earlier, Leslie was talking about, in the shift from the public to the private. Mm. And even in those public areas like that, it's all about how do we find the private money to do to do them up. And I'm, it could be very good, but um, I'm sceptical. Leslie, I should say that this is a, a, a retail complex, huge area of land in that centre, in Nottingham, between the, the railway station and going up the hill to Nottingham. It's a major thoroughfare, and it was in the middle of being redeveloped when COVID hit and the company concerned. Mm. So it's part demolished. It's it's a demolished site. There is a huge potential, but it's become a real issue in Nottingham about, uh, especially during COVID. We want more green space. Yeah, I mean, I think. You know, cities all over the world are, are grappling with what can sometimes seem like competing agendas, right? Greening, uh, climate change resiliency, and so on, social justice, equity issues. But to me, I think they have to be looked at together. So, for example, we don't want to uh, take on like a, a greening initiative that ends up kind of gentrifying an, an area or makes it um, too exclusive or not very welcoming for, for certain groups of people. Um, we also don't want to be, you know, when we're thinking about like, uh, you know, the, the effects of climate change on, on cities, especially like coastal cities and so on, we're already seeing in cities like Miami, um, wealthy people kind of gentrifying areas now away from the coast, right, that previously were low income working class, like Hispanic communities, because they want to be further away from storm surges and, and hurricanes. So, you know, the, these issues of environment and equity are, are very much tied together. So it, it's helpful, I think, to at least be considering both sets of questions at, at the same time, rather than thinking about them either as being in competition with each other or as being two totally separate sets of concerns. Mm, mm, indeed. Okay, um, we have no more questions from the audience. I, I wouldn't mind jumping in and asking just a, qu a quick one. It, it, you, could, you could say that this might be the subject of another whole conversation, but you talk right really eloquently about the psychic toll it takes of always being alert in the space. Um, that's not for you, whoever you are. Um, and that came particularly to the fore with the murder of Sarah Everard. Mm -hmm. And then it came to the fore again with the policing of the protest around that murder. So that protest was policed very extremely heavy handedly in contrast to how the football um, huge crowds have been policed in London. And you wonder if we're ever going to get forward. Um, I mean, we, we, we can just keep going with this, right? We have to keep doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was uh, just such a hard story to, to read and to, to understand everything that that happened around that. I mean, when we think about, you know, one of the things that kind of kept coming up in the media around Sarah Everard was, oh, she was doing everything right. You know, like she had taken all of the advice about what women are supposed to do when they're by themselves. You know, she was on the phone with someone. She was, you know, walking like in a, you know, like a populated area, like People knew who she had been with, all of this kind of thing. And yet this still happened to her. And of course it happened to her, I shouldn't say happened to her, was done to her by a police officer, right? Again, always a reminder that the police are not always there to keep us safe. Um, that, 
you know, it was, uh, and, and Simon has just shared a, a link to a piece that I wrote. And one of the things that I say in this box piece is like, that advice to women hasn't changed in like 150 years, except now it's also like carry your cell phone. That's the new piece, but everything else is the same, like dress modestly, go out in groups, um, don't go to certain parts of town, don't be out um, at night, don't talk to strangers. Like, <laughs> We're, we're still giving that advice. And as you say, it's that psychic toll, the burden that we put on women to adjust our behavior and to uh, try to somehow prevent violence from happening to us. And so little attention is given to extremely problematic, I'll just say male behavior. I think an example of which you could see in football, right? It's a kind of heightened collective example of male, like, uh, you know, taking over of, of urban space that on a much smaller day-to-day -day basis women witness and experience. So maybe it's time to, you know, turn that focus around and say, okay, what can men do to make the city safer for, for everybody rather than it always being women's burden to do so? That I think, or think we'll agree is a great note to end on. But thank you. thank you so much, Jane and Leslie for this evening. It's been really insightful. And I have to say, in the book, there are lots of light bulb moments and the way everything is framed to look at the city through various lenses is, is really, really interesting. And I think we should send it to all the bloody town planners and every, everybody who makes policy. But thank you everybody for coming and uh, don't forget to buy the book and it's, it's full of gems and thank you, good night, everybody. Thank you so much, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.